In April 1984, a young girl made a chilling discovery in Buck Toms Park in Knoxville, leading to a decades-long unsolved murder case. Investigator Jeff Day recounts the brutal killing of Terry Lynn Kirkland, whose death sparked fear among the community. Despite collecting evidence and conducting interviews, the case remained unresolved until recently, when a suspect was identified. Now, with the formation of a new homicide unit, investigators are revisiting unsolved cases, including Kirkland's, in hopes of finding closure for victims and their families. But, with crucial pieces missing, they still need help from potential witnesses to piece together the puzzle. As new leads emerge, could you be the missing link to finally uncovering the truth behind this decades-old mystery? On April 13, 1984, a child made a horrifying discovery in a Knoxville park. A young girl was playing. She resided near the park, said Knoxville Police Department investigator Jeff Day. Buck Tom's Park wasn't a big area. It was primarily forests, with some playground infrastructures like slides. Families would come here to unwind and let their kids play, and occasionally others would use it as a quiet spot for smoking after dark. Till this day, authorities had no idea what brought Terry Lynn Kirkland there. She was laying face down, partially naked, with multiple stab wounds. It was a very heinous, cruel slaying, Day stated. She also endured additional acts of brutality. The person who murdered her was extremely enraged and furious. The death of the 23-year-old instilled fear in the minds of neighbors. This is something you don't forget, a homicide, Day added. Those who lived there talk about it and expressed fear about it. It took place in a public park, and it was an atrocious murder. Investigators at the time interviewed people and gathered evidence, but they never got an explanation. There was a knife lying next to the body, the handle had been broken off, the blade and handle had been damaged, and it had blood all around it, explained Day. These days, the small public park is essentially non-existent, shrouded with trees, and Detective Jeff Day is now handling the case. There is a possible suspect. Can't tell you who, though, Day added. He claims the murderer of Kirkland was not a stranger. She was there with someone she recognized. I can guarantee she knew them, Day stated. The viciousness of the incident makes him presume a close relationship. The more brutal an act is, the more personal it is for them, Day remarked. He believes the individual responsible is still alive today. The suspects in this case are probably in their 50s now, and I believe at that time they were 20 to 25 years old, Day continued. Detective Day believes that the case is almost solved. It's kind of like a puzzle. It might not take much more, he said. Prosecuting a homicide case requires a specific amount of pieces. The pieces are present, yet there are some still missing. Those missing pieces are none other but people. It's exceedingly rare for a homicide to happen and the assailant to not confess to somebody, Day stated. It makes sense that a witness might be afraid. Perhaps now they feel more comfortable coming forward. The case of Terry Lynn Kirkland, who was discovered battered and stabbed to death in April 1984, was subsequently investigated by the newly established homicide unit. That homicide unit started functioning on February 26 and is in charge of investigating all killings, unexplained deaths, suicides, non-fatal shootings involving a victim, and any assault in which the victim sustained possibly life-threatening injuries. These investigations were formerly handled by the Violent Crimes Unit, which currently focuses on theft, bank robberies, assaults, aggravated assaults with non-serious injuries, workplace violence incidents, and adult missing people cases. Since its inception, the Homicide Unit has also been investigating unresolved homicide cases. Detectives who looked into the case identified a suspect who unfortunately passed away in 2021. The release states that the District Attorney General's office received the case file and determined that there was sufficient evidence to press charges against the suspect. The case had been dismissed since the alleged culprit had passed away. Chief Noel said, 
I appreciate Captain Morrow and Deputy Chief Coker for their optimism and support of this initiative. The Homicide Unit has done an amazing job of identifying suspects and advancing towards justice for victims and their loved ones, as evidenced by the nearly 70% of our homicide cases in 2023 that were successfully solved and the resolution of a nearly four decades old unresolved case. After years of haunting silence, the case of Terry Lynn Kirkland's brutal murder seemed destined to fade into obscurity. However, Recent developments have injected new hope into the investigation. With the unveiling of a suspect, albeit deceased, and the establishment of the homicide unit, momentum is building towards closure. Detective Jeff Day's tireless efforts suggest that the truth may finally be within reach, but amidst this newfound optimism, lingering questions remain. What secrets still lie buried in the shadows of Buck Tom's Park? And could the passage of time hold the key to unlocking the ultimate truth behind this chilling cold case? Share your thoughts and insights below as we continue our journey to unravel this decades-old mystery together. In a cold case spanning over four decades, the murder of Carol Joyce Delion has finally seen progress. A suspect has now finally been arrested and charged with her murder. Delion, last seen in 1981, was found shot six times in the head near a rest area in Comal County. Despite years of investigation, it was genealogy testing that led to the suspect's identification. But will justice prevail after all these years? Join us as we delve into the details of this gripping mystery. Who was Carol Delion, and what led to her tragic demise? How did investigators crack the case after so many years? And what secrets might be revealed as this case unfolds in court? Sandra Dillian, Carol's sister, said, We've been suffering for over 40 years not knowing what happened to my sister. The potential of what she could have been, what she could have been, will never be known. We were robbed of that. She was robbed of that. On the 3rd of June, 1981, in a San Antonio nightclub, Leon was last sighted. A few days prior to her death, detectives said she had recently received her diploma from Thomas Edison High School. The following day, a body was discovered in Kamal County, south of New Braunfels, close to a rest area on the grassy side of Interstate 35 North. Authorities attempted to identify the remains using fingerprints and local missing person reports at the time. Unfortunately, they did not succeed stated the Texas Department of Public Safety. Consequently, she was laid to rest in New Braunfels as a Jane Doe. It wasn't until 2009 when she would be identified as Delion. As per the arrest warrant, Delion sustained six gunshot wounds to her head. Furthermore, the autopsy revealed bruises on her neck, which led the authorities to conclude that the perpetrator was forcibly holding or restraining the victim's neck. Detectives stated that though some of her clothing had been taken off, there was no evidence of sexual assault. Fingernail scrapings were gathered during the autopsy, and almost three decades later in 2010, a DNA profile was generated from it. Nevertheless, detectives were unable to find a match after uploading the DNA profile into the CODIS database. A second sample of DeLeon's DNA was taken from his body in 2019, 38 years following the slaying, and it matched the DNA recovered from the fingernail scrapings. Later, the DNA was sent for genealogical analysis, and that yielded three potential suspects. Among them was Larry Allen West. In November 2021, Texas Rangers paid to visit to West at his workplace in Converse, and he willingly provided them with a sample of his DNA, as per an arrest warrant. West admitted to authorities, according to the police records, that he frequently visited bars in Bezar County in 1981 to meet with younger women. Nonetheless, he denied any involvement in the slaying of Deleon. Subsequently, Texas Ranger detectives announced last month that they had made progress in the investigation. They received a report of a DNA test that identified West as a possible match and essentially eliminated the likelihood of the foreign DNA recovered from Delian's body belonging to someone else. 
Larry Allen West couldn't be disregarded as the foreign contributor of this DNA profile, detectives declared in the arrest warrant. There is about a 1 in 422.1 quintillion chance that an unrelated individual chosen at random may contribute to this foreign DNA profile. It's just devastating to learn that she came across such a tragic fate, Sandra remarked. She had fought so hard to live. The ex-wives of West were also questioned by the detectives, and they portrayed West as an abusive person. West's first wife told detectives that she was only married to him for a month, and that during that time, he had abused and assaulted her on multiple occasions, based on an arrest warrant. Sandra has spent the last four decades fighting for answers regarding her sister's demise, and she added that her trust in God is what kept her going every day. Finally, she hopes to have closure. Sandra remarked, This is his last chance to make his peace, come clean, and give the rest of the family peace before he leaves this earth. I'm confident that justice will be served, one way or another. Online court records indicate that West was taken into custody on Thursday. A $125,000 bond was imposed on him. On Friday, West paid the bond and was freed from the custody. In May, West is scheduled to appear in court for a pre-trial hearing. After over four decades of uncertainty and unanswered questions, the case of Carol Joyce Delian's murder finally saw a glimmer of hope with the arrest of a suspect. Through the perseverance of investigators and the advancements in genealogy testing, a potential breakthrough emerged, shedding light on the tragic events that transpired in 1981. Yet, as the wheels of justice slowly turn, many mysteries still linger. What drove the suspect to commit such a heinous act? Will Carol's family finally find the closure they've been yearning for all these years? With the suspect's court appearance looming on the horizon, the true resolution of this chilling cold case hangs in the balance, leaving us all eagerly awaiting the next chapter in this gripping saga. What are your thoughts on this intriguing turn of events? Share your opinions in the comments below. For 28-year-old Vicki Lynn Belk and her boyfriend James Hill, the 27th of August, 1979 started off just like a normal day. On this particular Monday morning, which marked the beginning of a new work week, the couple got up, had breakfast, and then departed their Suitland, Maryland's apartment. They were on their way to the Department of Agriculture offices, where they both worked. Just like every other morning, the two started their journey in James's 1972 Buick and drove it all the way into Washington, D.C., instead of continuing their journey in the car. They decided to get off at Stadium Armory Station and utilize the metro system. Prior to parting ways that morning, Vicki informed James that she had some errands to run around lunch. She planned to catch the metro back to her car and meet James in the parking once he'd also got off work for the day. Without giving it much thought, James said that the plan sounded great, and that he would see her later. But when James got off the job that afternoon, he couldn't find Vicky or his vehicle anywhere within the parking area. In the end, he chose a different route to home, assuming that perhaps she had already returned to their apartment. But when he got home, she wasn't there either. Throughout the whole night, he contacted every acquaintance and relative of Vicky's he could think of, inquiring as to if they knew where she was. Strangely, not a single one of them had seen or heard from her. Unbeknownst to James at the time, Vicky had never even come back from lunch that day. By the next morning, James felt so concerned that he contacted the Prince George's County Police. He reported to have not seen his girlfriend for almost a full day and expressed his growing fear for her safety. This kind of abrupt disappearance was totally unlike of Vicky. She was a very competent and trustworthy woman. Vicky had obligations, including taking care of her seven-year-old son, Lamont. So it wasn't usual for her to drift off like this. Being the firstborn out of six children, Vicky had to put in a lot of effort to achieve her current position in life. She was a descendant of the civil rights movement and was among the first children in Alexandria, Virginia history 
to attend the integrated educational institutions. After graduating from St. Augustine's University in North Carolina, with a bachelor's degree in arts and education, she began working for the Department of Agriculture as a management analyst. She was a dedicated Christian and was actively involved in the Oakland Baptist Church in Alexandria. Unfortunately, Prince George's County Police received some unsettling news before their investigation into Vicky's disappearance could officially begin. Vicky was reported missing by James, and the very next day, her body was discovered in the nearby Charles County. It was a teenage lad riding a bicycle along Metropolitan Church Road in the Bryans Road subdivision who stumbled upon this horrifying discovery. When officials got to the crime scene, they validated every person's greatest concerns. These remains were indeed of Vicky Lynn Belk. Vicky's body was discovered about 20 feet away from the road in a forested area. Her fists were tightened and held up close to her collarbone as she lay on her back, presumably trying to oppose the assailant. She had passed away as a result of a bullet wound to the head. Tragically, though, that wasn't all. The medical examiner's further examination also showed that Vicky was subjected to a sexual assault. Knowing that Vicky's life may have ended so brutally was undoubtedly heartbreaking to her family and loved ones. On top of that, her little boy would now have to grow up without his mom. Judy, Vicky's younger sister, likewise found the moment to be particularly challenging. Just a fortnight ago, Vicky was selected as the maid of honor at her wedding. Her last memory of her was that moment. Growing up, Vicky had always been her guardian. Vicky was there for her, holding her hand and comforting her that everything would be all right, even as they faced the danger of hostility and violence as children during integration. Sadly, Vicky's family members were about to face even more challenges, as it became apparent that the homicide investigation would not be easy to conduct. There weren't any actual eyewitnesses or potential leads, and little did change even when James's Buick was found deserted in D.C. Considering the time period, other lines of inquiry were either not available or extremely restricted. To put this into context, even the most basic DNA procedures would not be performed in forensics until another seven years from 1979. Ultimately, the investigation was dropped by the authorities, as they had not much evidence. When DNA testing became accessible in the early 2000s, evidence gathered from the 1979's crime site was submitted for analysis. Detectives were especially interested in the dress and slip Vicky wore when she was slain. These clothes had fortunately been kept in good condition. Although semen thought to be that of the offenders was discovered, officials were only able to obtain a fragmentary profile. It was insufficient to enter into the CODIS database, and it probably wouldn't have allowed for a direct comparison. However, the circumstances were entirely different in 2022, when the evidence from Vicky's crime scene was re-examined using this new equipment. This time, a male DNA profile from her dress and slip was quickly obtained by investigators. After this evidence was uploaded to CODIS, investigators received a few additional encouraging leads. They eventually got the name of a suspect, Andre Taylor, after almost 44 years. Andre was 62 years old and in dire medical condition when officials tracked him down earlier this year. He was an inmate of a nursing and rehabilitation center in Washington, D.C., and had lost a leg previously. That being said, Andre had just turned 18 back in 1979. Additionally, Vicky's body was found fewer than four miles from where he lived. Andre has a lengthy criminal past, mostly including nonviolent offenses. Throughout his adult life, he had been in and out of prison. However, his longest sentence stemmed from something serious. He was accused in 1989 on suspicion of killing a guy by shooting him during a robbery. In that case, he was found not guilty of murder, 
but was sentenced to 5 to 15 years for carrying a firearm. Authorities located Andre, detained him, and accused him of killing Vicky. As of now, he might be undergoing a trial. Vicky's family, on the other hand, felt relieved and grateful to get some answers. At last, after all these years, her son Lamont, now 51 years old, made the following comment to the press. I just thank God for allowing us to be alive to bear witness to this momentous occasion. Our community is a little bit safer today with this person behind bars. Despite the fact that it took over 40 years to solve Vicky's murder, her family has long preserved her memory through the Vicki Belk Scholarship Foundation, an organization they founded. The organization grants scholarships to graduating seniors at Vicki's former church and has already assisted more than 100 people. 1993 saw the horrific killing of Melissa Ann Martinez in West Virginia. At first, her real name was unknown to the local law enforcement. Nearly after three decades, authorities announced that the murderer has finally been apprehended. Martinez resided on the 4600 block of Darnell Road, close to Huntington. Her birth name was McClure, and she also went by Lisa Anna Stepp as an alias. On March 16, 1993, at 4.23 a.m., cops responded to a shooting in an alleyway in Huntington's 1400 block between 4th and 5th Avenues, and upon arrival, discovered Martinez's body lying on a sidewalk. She had died from gunshot wounds and beating. She sustained a gunshot wound to her chest and had several lacerations all over her head. The victim was quickly taken to the nearest hospital and died there from her wounds. She sustained serious facial and head injuries that were consistent with those produced by a blunt object, and she was shot at least once in her torso. Her body was brought to South Charleston's medical examiner's office so that an autopsy could be performed. Back in Huntington, the people chose to ignore the tragedy that took a woman's life and instead focused on criticizing over what they regarded as an increase in violent crimes in the city. With Martinez's involvement in sex work, being constantly highlighted by the media coverage. Additionally, criticisms that perhaps not enough had been done by law enforcement in investigating the murder were circulated, which was usual at the time. Regardless, the case was shut down. The woman's acquaintances publicly mourned their loss. Her family, however, asked to remain anonymous out of concern for the woman's reputation as a result of her line of work. According to reports, her friends tried to raise funds so that a memorial could be erected in the location where she was discovered. Nevertheless, a cross was hung on a nearby utility pole that called for action in the case, yet was taken down shortly after. Don't let Lisa die in vain, was written on the cross. Following her untimely passing, Lisa's friend Ron Tillman told the newspaper, Lisa was like a family member to us, there is nothing left for anyone to remember her by. Our goal is to try and give some dignity to her. Around the time, witnesses reported to have heard a gunshot. An individual even claimed to have witnessed the woman being beaten. Detective Carl Brooks of the Huntington Police Department stated in 1993 that our next course of action will rely on where the leads take us. Speaking in anonymity to a newspaper, a brother of the deceased woman stated that although their family was never really sure why Martinez engaged in sex work, he went on to characterize it as lifestyle. Her brother told the newspaper, I've already prepared my mom in Las Vegas for the possibility that the individual who killed Lisa might never be caught. I mean, most people thought she was trash. I hope that's not how the police see it. The case eventually went cold. It wasn't until 59 years old Ricky Louie Woody was detained in December 2020 on a separate charge related to a domestic abuse complaint, accusing him of beating a woman with a bat, shoving her, breaking her cell phone, and threatening to kill her. A few months later, the defendant, who was initially considered a person of interest in the case, was said to have admitted to the murder of the lady he remembered by the name Lisa in the early 1990s. After considerable interrogation, Woody admitted to the murder, 
and the details were reported to the West Virginian Huntington Police Department. Following Woody's initial admission, officers from Huntington Police Department traveled to the Yellowstone County Detention Facility in Montana in September 2021. It was then that Woody was formally charged with Martinez's killing. In September 2022, a grand jury in Cabell County convicted Woody, and in October of the same year, he was formally charged with the homicide. Right now, he's being held at the Yellowstone County Correctional Facility. The Homicide of a 30-Year-Old Lady, whose body was discovered in the midst of the desert along Interstate 10, remained unsolved for decades. However, news of the arrest of a man alleged to be the perpetrator of the crime has brought some solace to Sherry Herrera's four children, thanks to advancements in DNA technology. When the victim's son, Adrian Herrera, learned of the case's breakthrough, he expressed uncertainty, saying, I don't know if I really believed it because it's like, man, this has been so long. Herrera was just six years old back when his mother had passed away. On March 30, 1993, his mother's body was discovered discarded close to Desert Center at the Hayfield Road I-10 exit. Herrera remarked that day would always stick in his memory. He stated, I remember coming home from school and my stepmother gave us the news about what had occurred. I was there with my sister. Of course, we burst into tears. Investigators were unable to determine how Sherry Herrera's body ended up by a motorway in the Southern California desert, roughly halfway between Palm Springs and the Arizona state line, given that she was from Tulare County in the Central Valley. According to Riverside County District Attorney Mike Hestron, the case was initially looked into by the county officials, yet went cold shortly after. We had no leads, no suspects. In the starting of the 90s, DNA evidence processing and screening were still in its early stages. However, Hestron stated that the chance to revive the murder investigation was made possible by the detectives' meticulous inspection of the site by their cold case unit approximately a year ago. Investigators in this case did a great job. The evidence was gathered, inspected, preserved, and sealed before being placed in a box as stated by him. Eventually, our cold case division goes back, reopen these unsolved cases and old boxes, and starts to investigate. Hestron mentioned that possible DNA evidence from the assailant recovered from the crime scene coincided with DNA evidence obtained at another homicide's crime scene in the state of Texas, though he did not elaborate on what it was they discovered that helped them solve the case. That murder happened in 1992. According to Hestron, our cold case team aided the Texas authorities in the investigation. As a result, that individual is also being looked into by Riverside County as a person of interest in connection with Sherry Herrera's killing. The accused suspect in the Texas homicide case and person of interest in the Herrera's case has been identified as 68-year-old Douglas Thomas. He was a long-haul truck driver at the time of the murders, stated Hestron, but currently he's retired. Officials from Texas reported that he was taken into custody at his Waco residence last week on suspicion of murder. Adrian Herrera claimed that the police informed him it wasn't Thomas's DNA whose match pointed authorities in Thomas's direction. It was of a relative, perhaps one of his children or a cousin, and then they traced it backwards, stated Herrera. This man would still be sitting behind his TV, enjoying whatever life that he had left, if it wasn't for this technology. Herrera was reportedly murdered during an assault. Prosecutors contended that possible murderer's DNA obtained at Herrera's crime site matched the DNA from the murder site in Titus County. According to the authorities, Thomas will first face prosecution in Texas, after which the Riverside prosecutors will demand for his extradition to California, where he'll then be facing charges for Herrera's murder. Please call 951-955-2777 to reach the Riverside County Regional Cold Case Homicide Unit if you have any information regarding this case. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us.
as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of unsolved cases.